I don't think it's only just the politician. It is educating the general public, right? So the general public has a very skewed view of how development works. They don't really understand how capital works, how the development process works, and how much risk a developer takes to put a project in the ground and to be able to complete the project. I don't need to rewrite a story. This story and the history is already here. How do we use real estate to recapture that glory that was and make it present? Technology is that thing that is going to make things more efficient and more effective. I think that's that's one of the keys. The staffing issues for property management is the same people that are working on these properties sometimes can't even live in the properties that they're working on. So that's my biggest challenge. We're at a crucial time in our society and especially here in America where, you know, a lot of the problems we're looking for somebody else to solve, but it's really upon us to do it. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Multifamily Hangout. We missed you guys. Uh, Chris and I have been all over the place. We, we've we been uh, places for the last couple of weeks, but we're glad we're back. So I'm Adrian Daniela, your host. I want to thank our sponsors for making this broadcast possible. They are Kairos and um, Coastal Painting Contractors. With this being said, uh, I want to turn it over to Chris to uh, introduce our guest today. Awesome. Hey, everyone, and welcome to join us live. Good to see you, uh, Haroon. We've got a great friend today. He does quite a bit, uh, so we're going to jump right in. But I want to welcome Haroon Cohens, who we actually met at the IMN conference out in uh, beautiful Denver. Haroon, was that maybe about a month ago or so, Denver? Yeah, it's about, yeah, about a month ago. And, and thank you. Thank you for, for having yeah, me. Yeah, and, and one of the coolest things, Haroon, is that, you know, uh, you are, you do quite a bit. But I think one of the coolest things is that you got your eye on development in a very special way in multifamily. So partnering locally, partnering on a, on a state level. And then you're also, we also got to meet up in Atlanta, Georgia. And so it's cool to see the things yeah. that you're doing and how in, engaged you are. Because it's so difficult. And one of the things I want to dive in today is the challenges that developers go through and how difficult it can be. But when you go in with positive intent and you go in with a vision in mind and you go in with the right partners, that's something I took away from you. So I'm really excited to have you here today to kind of share your story, share the challenges you've gone through, but also um, what you're optimistic about uh, in both Denver and in Atlanta and also in development in general. So thanks for joining us and for spending some time with us. Well, thank you. It's been a, it's just been a pleasure to, to meet you. Uh, at the IMN conference, and uh, thank you both for having me on today. It's uh, grateful, grateful to be on. Uh, Haroon Cowens, again, from Denver, Colorado. Uh, I am the CEO and founder of a, a boutique firm uh, that is growing sp uh, specifically as a developer here in uh, the city of Denver, Colorado. I'll just give you just a small snapshot just of my history. You know, I got into development um, orientated from the financial sector. I was in financial services and as a stockbroker, financial advisor. Uh, but I came to a neighborhood uh, prior to, to being in financial services as an entrepreneur at 19 years old. And so that same neighborhood, I came back to turn around a commercial branch uh, in an underperforming area. And so thank God we were able to do it um, in an amazing way. And that gave me an appreciation for the neighborhood, which also segued into uh, this curation of that neighborhood. And so really my, my, my passion for real estate came from that orientation, uh, you know, when I was at that branch, uh, you know, it, it was more transactional and I wanted to be more community oriented. And so my experience was how do I be how do I bring a win to the community in a bigger way? And really, that was through the, um, you know, the curation through uh, spaces. I mean, you know, developers are the curators of spaces. Um, you know, people say, well, Rune, how did you get in real estate and why did you get in real estate? My th the thing I tell them is you're in real estate just as much as I am. Uh, we live in it, we eat in it, we play in it, uh, we work in it. And so it is one of the, I think, one of the best fields to be in, to be able to affect the human ecology, if you will. And so, um, you know, it came from that kind of passion. And so we're really involved right now in a, a space, I think, that, of course, Denver is... Um, looking to in the state of Colorado, but I think we're seeing it across the nation and which is this interesting piece when we talk about affordability. Um, oftentimes when we talk about affordability, it's this, this the, the, the piece of 
uh, low income, if you will, right? Tax credit, low income tax credit um, situations. Uh, but we're looking at, especially some of the crises that we see across the nation of middle income, right? Uh, those those income levels at 60 to 120 AMI, uh, that's what we're focused on. And so we're really happy to be advancing some things in the the, the metro area, but that is also uh, for the state of Colorado. I want to go back to where you started as an entrepreneur. How many years you've been doing? You've been an entrepreneur. I think most of my life, um, I've been an entrepreneur um, outside of you know working for the bank, uh, working as a stockbroker, uh, and as well as my my uh, my foray into real estate. It was a great mentor. His name was Carl Bourgeois. I worked for him for three and a half years, but on and off, you know, since I was twenty, uh, I would say it's almost you know twenty. 20 plus years of, of entrepreneurship. And I think the entrepreneurship uh, made me realize about, uh, you know, being creative and as well as because in, in real estate, one, you have to be very creative. I mean, nothing is just straight up like, hey, this is the deal. This is what it looks like. So creativity. The other thing is perseverance. I think that perseverance is is a a, a, a advantage that you do have to continue to, you know, um, use that skill on an often basis is that you have to persevere through some of the tough challenges some of the uh some of the things that some people would leave you would persevere in. and then also the third thing i think is just you know it's a rewarding i mean that you're able to make some things that that also come to life that may impact people in a most positive way and so entrepreneurship is you know something that uh, i think is most empowering um it's also hard you know, it's not the, you know, you wake up and you're just, you know, successful. I've had some so many challenges and so many, you know, times of down. It's, it's high stress as well. So uh, but you're able to manage it and really not only get through it, but also be an example for others that come come behind you. As far as advice for people that are considering a entrepreneurship career, what are some pieces of advice that you have for them after 20 plus years doing this? Well, I think one is mentorship, right? First, before you even jump into something, grab, you know, good mentors that have a lot of integrity um, and also been in sectors in which you may have a, a level of interest that have have had the ups, the downs, and that have had uh, some staying power in those industries. So I think mentorship is one of the big key pieces. And then educate yourself as well. And, um, and then the third thing is pace yourself um, because some oftentimes, you know, especially now you see entrepreneurship as a key to, of course, financial success. But at the same time, it also comes with uh, being prepared. And so, you know, we live in a society and what's often is, you know, it's instant and nothing is instant in entrepreneurship unless, you know, you, you know, uh, very few times you have situations where the road is just up from as you start. And so I think those those things are some things that I, I myself that try to implement in my life. And that's why I also try to pass on to others is, is some of those keys. I think a lot about, I love what you said about mentorship, having people and then yourself paying it forward. If you were to think about some of the people in your life, the mentors that, you know, paid it forward to you, whether you had short interactions or long ones that maybe made, you know, I think a lot about small impacts in our life that we don't think, you know, when we're helping other people, you say something or you do something and it makes a massive fork in their life to accelerate their careers, help them. And they remember that they'll never forget that. Is there anyone that did that for you, you know, specifically that you want to call out? Uh, maybe it was a, a person at a conference or a person that's, that's been there uh, through your childhood or even in, in more recently in your career. Yeah, I would say there's a number of people, um, you know, that really, especially in real estate, it was uh, Carl Bourgeois, who he, he was a gentleman who passed two years ago was the, the person that gave me a chance in real estate. Uh, so I would say he was a, a, a very benevolent entrepreneur, humble guy with, with a lot of humility. And so I learned a lot from him. Another gentleman um, is Evan Makowski. He's probably the most, uh, has the most integrity that I've, I've worked with. Um, he, he has taught me a lot about integrity and business um, and really stay in power. Uh, and so I still would meet with him often to this day. And so, um, and still is a, still is a mentor to me. And, you know, there's a, a number of others. Uh, my business partner is, you know, he his his, his firm is a larger firm. And so I, there's some things that I learned from him, even, even uh, to this day. Um, and, and another gentleman, I would, I would say has been uh, an inspiration. 
in just entrepreneurship. And he comes from Denver. His name is Robert F. Smith. He is a, a tremendous figure in uh, in you know in the business world, but he's also a huge uh, impact to 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 me and as well as even in my city. So, your company is uh, you're developing new real estate, but you're also managing real estate. Uh, would you share with us some challenges that you have as a developer? What are the main challenges? What are the things that keep you awake at night in this current economical and political environment? And uh, what are some ways in which you overcome those challenges? Yeah, thank you. That's a great. That's a great question. I think that one of the the, the biggest uh, challenges is, of course, what we've been facing over the last two years. Um, specifically when we talk about uh, high interest rates, uh, we have talked about and we've seen, of course, um, a cut just recently, but high interest rates, the high interest rate environment has been a challenge. Uh, the acceleration of of the cost of goods and the cost of um, and also the cost of, you know, materiality over the last several years. I mean, the high demand of multifamily in the, you know, in the last 12 years has, has created a, you know, such high price increases. And I think we've hit a peak, but at the same time, it has been uh, a challenge. And so, you know, when you look at that and then, you know, at the macro environment, I mean, we have a lot of geopolitical situations that are happening even currently. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I also, uh, you know, not fear, but just is our challenge with our even current political environment as well. I mean, and so you think about these things on how those macro things are going to impact uh, your life individually, but also holistically, even in the industry. And so um, the good thing for us is that we've um, in 2022, we, um, you know, uh, my business partner, Mark Falcone, architected this this uh, very uh, innovative approach into financing middle income housing. And so, um, you know, price increases do affect that, but the double tax exempt bond financing have allowed us to continue to move projects forward. But we still concern about the overall environment that everybody else is is concerned about. And I think, you know, um, it it could produce uh, paralytical fears if you if you allow it. Um, and so for me, I think the thing that I I, I would just say this on this uh, Rosh Hashanah, you know, for me is the biggest thing for me is my faith is is helpful to me in anchoring and anchoring into being able to uh, navigate some of these challenges. Because some things, could, you know, if you think about them all the time and you ruminate over them, it could drive you crazy. And especially when you're responsible for a lot of folks, especially when you have a lot of responsibility on, on your shoulders. And so for me, um, that is the thing that uh, allows me to be optimistic about the future. And even in the midst of challenges, I mean, I think the craziness of what happens in our world, that we should also be solution oriented. I, I don't want to run from the problems. I want to run to the problems and begin to be an, a solution. I think that's where the entrepreneur entrepreneurial spirit comes from as well. I think something you um, have talked about is you're focusing on a, a unique way uh, to partner, whether, like you said, like with the city or the state in, in uh, Denver and, and Colorado. And I'm kind of curious to hear if you could share with some of the others you know, the, in our audience about maybe some of the work you're doing, how you're thinking about homelessness and, and kind of bridging the gap between um, philanthropic work, development work, for-profit business, and then also partnering with government yeah. entities. My foray into to real estate was really from a more community orientation. You know, I grew up in the neighborhood that um, I got to see, uh, oversee a large investment into that neighborhood from a real estate perspective and be able to help be curator that's, you know, that create some possibilities in that neighborhood. And so I always have a heart and orientation towards a, a community approach. You know, we've seen, and especially from D in Denver specifically, uh, in, in our metro area, in some neighborhoods, we've seen a 200% increase of the values of housing in, in, in these neighborhoods. And you think about that 200% uh, value of housing. I mean, some of that is great. I mean, that's economic development that says that this city is growing. That's, that says there is economic opportunities. That says there's a lot of demand. But at the same time, there's another side of it that says some people that were able to afford don't aren't able to afford to live in these same places. I mean, whether it's from, uh, you know, young professionals moving into, into the city of Denver and the metro area, whether it's also employers that are looking to hire folks that now uh, have to travel further away to uh, come to uh, come to work 
uh, or whether that's also, you know, the the supportive workers. You know, you talk about our nurses, you talk about our supportive healthcare workers, uh, you know, our ambulatory folks, uh, and our firefighters, our police officers, our teachers, especially. And so you think about those individuals. Um, if you look across the nation, and especially, and I could speak specifically to the Denver metro area, when you've seen all these increases, what you have is, you know, you have a mix where there it becomes problematic for some some folks to have affordability. And so I would say in 2001, um, in 2000, I met my partner, uh, known of him because he's done a lot of amazing projects here and transformative in our city uh, and in for Colorado. Uh, but we started to talk about the solution. What can we do to bring solutions to to Colorado, the state itself? And, and so uh, there was this model, um, which of course there's pieces of it in, in California, Texas, and have been tried. Uh, across the nation. But our idea was, um, and he was the architect of this, is our idea was how do we use almost like infrastructure? How do you use double taxes and bond financing to finance real estate in the sense of multifamily because of the units that we need uh, for affordability? And so in 2022, uh, we introduced, we supported a bill. You know, my partner was the architects and I, our firm, my firm really were helpful in writing this bill, which was Bill SB 232 for Colorado. And we introduced the bill in May of 2022, two weeks into the end of legislation. And I think we did that just to play with my my sleeping habits because I'm a good sleeper, but uh, I lost a lot of sleep uh, for two weeks. Um, and so... Um, we introduced the bill and that bill got introduced. And that was still when people were still kind of on the fence about what is middle income housing, right? Our workforce housing. And so we were educating our legislators and, you know, so thankful for the sponsors, uh, Senator Jeff Bridges, Rep. Rep. Uh, has Leslie Herrett, uh, Senator Coleman, then Senator Dominic Moreno. They took the bill and they were able to champion the bill, uh, sponsor the bill. And uh, what we had to do is really educate our peers because there were some folks that were even against the bill. There was 26 organizations that almost lined up against the bill um, because they thought the appropriation, because they didn't understand the mechanism, they thought there was an appropriation that was going to be taken from the lower income. And so what we were able to do is advance this bill that was uh, purely for the state of Colorado. And so what it does, it allows developers, private developers, to work with the state of Colorado through the Middle Income Housing Authority to be able to develop projects specifically for the 60 to 120 AMI. Uh, and even in the mountain towns, it could go up to 150 AMI area median income. And so what it does, it allows developers to, we wanted to have a, an appropriation where developers were able to go do, do acquisition and pre-development. But right now, what we have started to do is work with other philanthropic firms. Uh, this is family offices. These are comp uh, 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 public companies like DaVita and a big shout out to DaVita. We're, we're able to help developers like ourselves to say, hey, listen, developers are sticking in their knack out. We also need some other partners. And so what it is, is this middle income housing authority is the first of its kind, I, I believe in the nation for a statewide authority that is focused on middle income housing, but it allowed the developers to now step in a role that I think developers should be in as a, a solution to uh, one of the problems that we're having is affordability. And so what we've been doing is over the last two years is really working with uh, stakeholders and really educating, but then also having other ways and, and means of financing this mechanism before the bond financing is able to kick in when the project is uh, fully either stabilized or completed. And so it's an interesting mechanism that you know folks are being educated on. Uh, we're very proud of our first project that we're submitting to the Middle Income Housing Authority. And again, we're doing that project with the publicly traded company called DeVita, and we're going to deliver 90 units uh, in the city of Denver on the edge of downtown in the neighborhood in which uh, I, I'm passionate about. It's going to be one of those markers that folks are going to, many other folks are going to uh, fall in line and say, hey, how do we deliver more? I know that it's only 90 units, but it's a 90 impactful units to this middle income housing authority. And now a word from Dean Fungawing, founder and CEO, Kairos. There's so many maintenance issues that can be solved with simple data that tells you, hey, this is not working right. Go take care of it. Our core technology, you know, it started with leak detection, right? And again, knowing about the issue sooner rather than later, right? And the difference between our sensor and most sensors that you can find on Amazon or anywhere else is those are consumer grade sensors. And you know, when you're dealing with multifamily buildings, uh, you're dealing with commercial buildings, you're dealing with an environment that's a little bit more intensive 
than a home. 250 homes in a community as opposed to one home. You've got a lot more redundancy of risk. And so this technology notifies you in any place that you need to know that there's water. The instant, the moment that there's water in that area, anywhere behind the dishwasher, in the front of the dishwasher, the water heater pan, the HVAC closet, the washing machine, laundry room applications, hydronic pumps. We've seen all kinds of areas, PTAC units in places like New York. We, had, we created a specialized sensor just for PTAC units because, again, we print this material, this conductive material. And that conductive material is attached to this little module. And that module sends out a signal. It's operating on a 10-year battery. It has the ability to transmit a signal from five to 10 floors of concrete in a commercial building. That means that you have to have 35 times fewer base stations to collect all that data. You've got this broad covers. Now you've got visibility across your site of the real-time risk. And coming very soon is severity context so that your maintenance guys aren't seeing a bunch of signal noise and they're in ignoring things, right? Those are newer sensors that we're coming up with. And really what we've seen from customers is that they're avoiding insurance claims. One other challenge for developers that you know we're learning during our conversations with guests and outside of that is that pretty much for each dollar of cost to develop new product, about 42 cents out of each dollar, it's regulations. That's in many ways excessive. What are some things that the private sector could do to put some pressure on a politicians to help with that. I, I just think that, you know, when you build like that reflects in like somebody's paying for it. Initially yeah. you pay for it, but eventually you're going to recover that from the renters, right? Yeah. So that really doesn't make the housing more affordable. It's, it's kind of the other way around. So yeah. what are some things that we could, the private sector could fight against that or like, you know, make the situation better, you know, yeah. to overcome. That's a good question, Adrian, and thank you for asking that. I think the one of the biggest things is, I don't think it's only just the politician, it is educating the general public, right? So the general public has a very skewed view of how development works. They don't really understand how capital works, how the development process works, and how much risk a developer takes to put a project in the ground and to be able to complete the project. I think, you know, what the general public, uh, that the private developers must do is to, I believe, is start to create coalitions of education. And one is to be a educator of how how did we get to a place of unaffordability, right? Because at the end of the day, as you said, Adrian, it affects for every 42 cents that is out of the dollar, it's going to affect the end user, which is the renter or, or the buyer, right? So the buyers are, are going to feel the pinch. And they're feeling the pinch and they think it's really us, just the developers, without understanding that like, there's a lot of other things. There's a lot of other steps that are behind this. And so outside of just the cost of, you know, the cost of materials, the cost of the workers, the, the cost of the cost of capital, there's also this regulatory cost. And I think what the education would do is be able to also now tap into some of the legislators. Legislators want to be able to be a solution, right? But they got to know what their constituents are saying and they got to know what their, you know, the public is saying. And so usually they pick up from what the public is saying. And so for us, I think that we have to, as developers, uh, have to do a better job of educating the end user that, hey, we're not against you. It's not that we're just, you know, many people think that it's oh, the developers are just, you know, they're going on and they're just just continuing to escalate rents or they're continuing to escalate costs without understanding the process. And I think we have to do a better job of bringing those parties together as well as champion legislators that understand it as well. Because I, I remember, you know, in 2016, 17, in our city, you know, developers were demonized, you know, they're the problem. And now I, I believe it is a prime time for us to be a solution, but we also have to stick our neck out and be able to create coalitions. I know we have some gripes about how things are working, but we have to create coalitions to say, hey, listen, we're here to, we're here to make solutions, but we need to educate you. Here's how we need you, public which we need your in input as well so that your legislators can start to do some things to make going through the process of getting projects processed you know at city levels and permitting and all that one one of the big things is time time and as well as fees a lot of these things take a lot of time and time on a project is a lot of money and so i think you know i'm really happy that now in the city of denver and across colorado we have you know our our governor our mayor everybody's in sync with affordability and they're in sync with the folks that are going to begin to implement the solution which is from going to be from the private sector you know this is the public sector is not going to solve it 
They can be able to create solutions by legislation, but it's going to be the developers that are going to implement this solution for our, I believe, our housing crisis. That's going to be uh, a crisis for a very long time. It's, a, it's something you and I spoke about, which is, you know, developers are taking some of the most largest risk ever. And, you know, specifically, we talk about the five points business improvement district, right, that you're very active in. Um, you're betting on yes. a community. You're a community builder and you're betting on something that may not pay out for years, uh, right? Three, four, five, six, even more longer years to get approvals where you're not seeing a penny until people start moving in. And, uh, you know, we talked about it here in Atlanta because we have a five points as well. And we have a South downtown where people have tried to develop, started developing or redoing, doing redevelopment and uh, went bankrupt after six or seven years. And they spent hundreds of millions of dollars in the community and lost everything. So I, I'd love to hear maybe a little bit more about, I mean, obviously, why are you so excited about five points? And why have you gotten so involved in the neighborhood? Because I love hearing stories, and especially when there's that historical relevance, uh, that would be great to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, and thank you for bringing that up, Chris. I, I think, um, you know, I grew up about five minutes technically outside of Five Points, right? So I grew up in the neighborhood. And my father used to tell me about Five Points since I was a kid. And Five Points for Denver is, it was called the Harlem of the West. And so what it was is that it in the 1920s, there was a, uh, a big influx of African-Americans into, into the city of Denver for opportunities. And they moved into this neighborhood called Five Points. And the reason it's called Five Points is because of the streets at 26th, 27th, Washington and, and Walton, all of them coming to a line at a Five Point intersection. This was a part of the streetcar. Uh, in in Denver's, and so you had the porters and waiters, and then you had other, a lot of other ac economic opportunity that were here in in Colorado, and so Five Points became known um, for a place where you know the jazz artists, as they were traveling across uh, the country, this is one of their main stops as they were going west, and so they would stay and play in Five Points. So you know, if you think about Ella Fitzgerald, you uh, Dots Fam, you know Duke Ellington, you think about uh, Billy Holiday, you think about all of these greats, they stayed and played in this neighborhood. And this neighborhood was also a red line. And so you could not leave the neighborhood. You couldn't live anywhere else. And so what it did, it created a place where it was a curation of entrepreneurship. So you had all your pharmacies, your doctors, your lawyers, you had music, you had a very vibrant neighborhood. And so that neighborhood was celebrated for, for many, many years, but it went into disrepair in the late 1960s up into just the 2010s. Um, and that economic disrepair um, was just like any other, uh, any other of its like in across the nation. And so for me, it was when I was growing up, it was in a place of disrepair. I always heard about these stories like here's what this legend used to do. And here's, you know, and some of those people lived, lived even at the time when I was a, a uh, a teenager. Matter of fact, my first, my first place that I leased from, my, it was a commercial space, and it was it, I leased from a gentleman named Charles Cousins, and he was a legendary figure in in Five Points. And I would go drop off my check for rent to his house, and he would tell me about how he started in business, and he started in business like I did. He he was in real estate, and he started in business. He was operating jukeboxes, and so all this history was in the neighborhood, but it came in disrepair. And so for me, it was like. How do I, I don't need to rewrite a story. This story and the history is already here. How do we use real estate to recapture that glory that was and make it present and not make it like a museum? There's already one museum here, but make it active today where people can experience it. People can enjoy it. All people can come and be able to experience the the vitality, the liveliness of the history and the present. That was always my mission after being at the, you know, at first I was in music, so I thought I was going to do it in a, mu in a music way, but it started to be into, into real estate. And for me, that's what my passion was and still is, is how do we unlock the potentiality and curate and cultivate? And I use the word instead of implement is cultivate. The, the, the history is here. It's not replaceable. It's just how do you cultivate it to its best and highest use by using real estate to be able to show, you know, and as people are, you know, around the nation are looking for experiences, you can come and experience a neighborhood that has its particular flavor, its particular history that people will enjoy. And so from a 
a hospitality offering, from a art and culture offering, or even just, you know, from a uh, architecture offering. My, my dream is to bring it to its highest and best use and cultivate it to its full potential. And so I'm very passionate about the neighborhood. I am the board chair of the Five Points Business Improvement District, very involved in the F Five Points neighborhood. I live in Five Points. And so even my first two projects in this middle income housing is in Five Points. Um, and so I, I have a big passion for this neighborhood as I have a big passion for the state of Colorado and big passion for being a, a solution oriented person. When you see a problem, how do we begin to, to solve it? And so I seen the problem in Five Points was how do we untap its potential? And real estate is that thing that really untaps it. Aaron, before going live, we're talking about the fact that you're also an operator. You also manage properties, multifamily. So the current economical situation, you know, obviously, as we were talking, uh, affects renters as well. What are the main challenges, the things that keep you up at night as operator? So from an operator standpoint, what are the, you know, the biggest challenges that you're facing right now? And what are some opportunities out there for operators like you? Well, I think the opportunities uh, is one is technology, be able to concisely bring some programs together that you know when you're talking about maintenance when you're talking about leasing when you're talking about also being able to be ahead of certain property management problems that technology is that thing that is going to make things more efficient and more effective i think that's that's one of the keys and thank you for chris for inviting me uh to the the prop tech in las vegas because i learned so much there and it's something that you know got a lot of context to be able to talk to some other some other operators but also other companies that are doing special things in that and so i think innovation is really going to be helpful for the end user right because whatever costs for us is also a cost for for the renter so i think that's number one uh what keeps me up at night is you know at the end of the day is we're in this tight situation where you have these this economic cycle that is really distinctly different than what i've seen in my lifetime right and so when you have these economic forecasts you don't know really what's you know what you're up against right and so i was talking to one of the property managers just just about two weeks ago as we were visiting another property that's close to one of ours and what she said is like listen room we have a, a saturation of the luxury multifamily happening and we we have now put stabilization which used to be at 92 percent now down to the uh, low 80s right and so what my concern is you know as you have some of these things that are happening where you have a lot of units that have been delivered. Here's one of the biggest concerns on, on the property management is on the older properties, how do you make sure and ensure that being able to deliver for folks that are, you know, looking for, you know, some affordability are looking to, especially in your B, B, A minus and B class units. And so how do you keep pace with some of the other amenities that are that are around and make sure that your property management is really attentive to the needs of your, your folks? Uh, but I think uh, just on a full spectrum is as we get more units under our asset management and property management is really about the staffing. And one of the key things is because of the unaffordability, you also have staffing that have to live so far away from the properties that they manage. That's the thing that really bothers me is the staffing issues for property management is the same people that are working on these properties sometimes can't even live in the properties that they're working on. So that's my biggest challenge is the unaffordability for the supportive services for our property managers. And so some of your maintenance techs that are moving and they're having to move often, and some of them are some good people. Uh, and you want to always keep and retain good people. And so my challenge is that's the challenge that is anecdotally there is that always the human resource is the biggest challenge uh, right now, at least from, from my standpoint. Yeah. The, uh, there was a great article and I'm not sure if I sent it to you, it was, but it was great to meet you at blueprint again, and, you know, hear more about what you're working on and the challenges off the record. But, uh, Sharon Gina Wilson, who's the chair of NMHC just wrote an article, uh, last week about how development is really the biggest, hardest thing for people to be able to achieve the, the, uh, American dream. Right. And people who work in our restaurants, who you know deliver our food, drive us to the airport, all of these jobs that are so important to our economy, they're driving an hour to two hours to get to their house. And they don't know where they can live when rents are skyrocketing. So I think to your point about nimbyism, right, we have to make sure we're building and giving people an opportunity to live near great schools and great parks and great 
their jobs. And I completely agree with you that, with that. And I think we need to figure that one out. I, yeah. I always think back to my roots, like you said, and I'm really curious because, you know, sharing your story of how you've evolved and how you've gotten to where you are today and you're giving back and focusing on supporting and positivity and optimism, you know, you've answered some of this question, but how do you want to be remembered? What is, what is Haroon's legacy of the impact you make on the communities that you, you work in? What, what do you want that legacy in the way you want to be remembered? I want my legacy to be remembered as a person that used his faith to be delivered in different ways that were unconventional. And so real estate being one of the biggest parts, right, is I want to be remembered as a person that, had, you know, has a heart for communities in general and heart for people. And as a preacher, I want to preach in a different way. So I want my assets, the buildings, the things that um, that we deliver. I want them to be consistent to what I say on Saturdays, that it's also the same delivery in, in the business world. Like everybody doesn't have to, you know, agree and see it the same way I do, but they can say, Hey, we might disagree, but we can't deny that his faith was really the impetus to, uh, what he did and why he did it and how he did it. And, and also being an inspiration for others, the development industry, real estate development is a cash intensive capital intensive business. And, you know, there was an article that was written in May of 2023, uh, or it was March, March or May of 2023, about even for African Americans in real estate development. And there was only 432 firms across the nation. And I want to be one of those firms that uh, show people that it's still, there is still hope for others that, um, you know, there's a lack of their representation. And so I also want to be a representative that came from a middle class home, but I came from a challenged neighborhood. The road that it took for me to even get here was an unconventional road. But it, I, I want to also to be a, my legacy that he, he has a legacy of hope and a, hope is one of the biggest things. And so those are the things that I always think about is that what do you leave behind and how do you impact the world in a, a tangible way that uh, for me, that reflects my spiritual values. Aaron, it's been an amazing conversation and it's been so great to have you here today. Very inspiring. What are some final thoughts that you know you would like to share with the audience? Maybe answer a question you wish we would have asked or, you know, just any thoughts. I would like to share that collaboration is one of the biggest tools that we as humans have. And I think there needs to be more of it um, now. And especially some of the problems that we see in our world right now. Um, collaboration is whether it's in real estate, whether it's in any other industry, we need more collabor a collaborative approach. And not just for a revenue outcome, not for a net profit outcome, but for also a solution outcome. And I never would be where I'm at today without collaboration, without partnership, without others. And so never forget the people along the way, because I, I think that's so important and that's very key. I, I'm a summation of all those that invested in me, right? And so I think that's, um, that's something that I think is very important because sometimes we're so focused on the destination and not the journey. And so the destination is not the goal. It's the journey is like all those that invested in me from, you know, my parents, my mother, my family members, my friends, uh, my mentors, even those people that haven't been so nice to me is there's all all this investment that it was a culmination of others that invested in me. And whatever I've been able to do is because the collaboration of others and the implementation of others. And so I think that uh, we're at a crucial time in our society and especially here in America where, you know, a lot of the problems we're looking for somebody else to solve, but it's really upon us to do it. Talking about our November election, one of the things I think that we need to remember is that it's not only going to be the leaders who we elect, but it's going to be us, the people that need to make sure that we want our future to look better and it's going to take us to do it. So that's what I just want people to, uh, if they got anything to think about is it's us and, and real estate is, is one tool that I think is, is very important to all of us. Um, as I said before, you know, live, you know, housing people is very, very critical, critical, especially in the multifamily, but all the other things, I mean, we are all the human ecology includes, uh, real estate and real estate is one of those major things that is not going to go away. And so it's a necessary and needed industry. And as we're in a needed industry, we also have a needed voice that comes from the real estate uh, community. I love this closing, especially the part that said, you didn't say it, but I'm going to say it. If you want change, you, you got to become the change. That's right.
If you want to expect a change, don't expect it from others. Become the change leader way. Amazing words to, to close the conversation with. Thank you again for being with us. Chris, any thoughts? Any final thoughts? It's been a, a blast, Arun, to hang out, go a little bit deeper. I can't work, wait till our next in, in person uh, meeting soon. You know, in your world, you're always thinking about deadlines. So when, when do you think you'll have your, your next uh, units available for people to be able to rent in, in Denver? In this middle income housing structure, hopefully we'll be under construction in 20, 2025. Uh, so I would say 18 months a after probably in the second quarter, third quarter. Like, as you know, as you know, Chris, it, you know, it's a long, long leeway to, to delivery. Uh, we look forward to getting those delivered. You know, I'm in negotiate on another project uh, that we may be even to, able to deliver uh, e even much sooner. So that hopefully we'll get some of that news very soon. Well, Godspeed to you. And is there anything else we can help or the audience can help you with right now? Um, no, I just, I, I'm so thankful, you know, thank you, Chris. And thank you, Adrian, for having me. The, the just uh, thankful for all the support and, you know, supporting any of the initiatives that Goshen is doing. Uh, I would, I would say that. Awesome. We'll see you soon. Thank you again. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Once again, thank you everybody for watching us. Signing off another episode of a multifamily hangout. I want to remind you all our sponsors are Kairos and Coastal Painting Contractors. Hopefully you guys check them out for insurance liability reduction and for all of your general contracting needs, especially in the Southeast. We'll see you next week with an amazing guest. We're not we're not seeing who the guest is going to be, but check, you know, just make sure to follow Chris and I on LinkedIn for the time and a day. We're shooting for Thursday, but the time might not be our regular time, 3 p.m. Eastern, but definitely we're shooting for next Thursday with a, another incredible guest. Have an amazing afternoon all. Thank you. Thank you.